Welcome, welcome, welcome to this week's episode of the American Serial Killer Guidebook with your intrepid hosts, Elton and Cherish Morgan. Welcome to episode three of the American Serial Killer Guidebook, continuing your journey into the minds of America's most demented and brutal serial killers. I'm your host, Elton Morgan, and by my side, my beautiful co-host and wife. I'm Cherish Morgan. And we're We're the the Morgans. Morgans. This episode is all about a murderous necrophiliac named Jerry Brudos, whose particular pathology is that he loved to play dress-up with his victims, then raping them before and after death. That alone isn't really too out there, but you add in the fact that he enjoyed doing these things over the course of days, secretly keeping them captive in his house while his wife and children were home. All right, now that takes his actions to a whole new level of depravity. You'll hear all about it and more, so stay tuned to be happily disgusted by the actions of Jerome Henry Brudos on this episode of the American Serial Killer Guidebook. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on your favorite maniacs. We are about to take you on a journey into a depraved mind of a man, if you can call him that, who not only enjoyed murdering and raping young women, but keeping their bodies for days to violate them repeatedly in death before disposing of their bodies in a local river. Commonly known as Jerry, Brudos was born in Webster, South Dakota on January 31, 1939 to rural farmers Henry and Eileen Brudos. Shortly after Jerry was born, his family decided to quit farming for a better life in Oregon, where his father worked two jobs trying to put food on the table, but alcoholism led to abuse and financial instability. Jerry spent most of his free time with his mother, Eileen, who by all accounts didn't like that he was born a boy. She already had three sons and badly wanted a little girl, so when Jerry was growing up, she took that resentment out on him and wasn't afraid to let him know how much of a disappointment he was. Some believe this was the reason she reacted so badly when, at the age of five, he found a pair of women's shoes at the dump and secretly took them home to wear around the house. I'm not sure why no one ever wondered why a five-year-old boy was wandering around the dump by himself, but hey, I guess it was a different time. Once his little pastime was discovered by his mom, she went crazy and forced Jerry to watch as she took the shoes into the backyard and set them on fire. Some psychologists believe it was the idea of a woman's shoes and clothing being forbidden that helped fuel his future obsession with cross-dressing and dressing the bodies of his victims in the way that stimulated his sexual interest including being caught a short time later trying to steal the shoes of his nursery school teacher. By 1955, at the age of 16, the Brudos family managed to work their way up to the middle-class life, moving into a nice home next to neighbors with three teenage daughters. Jerry was immediately overwhelmed by the girls and not only began spying on them, but started stealing their underwear from the clothesline any chance he got. He stole so many clothes that the thefts were reported to police, which gave Jerry an idea that would lead to more significant sexual depravity to come. He somehow convinced one of the neighbor girls that he was working with the cops to crack the missing underwear case and convinced her to come by and discuss the case. Just the facts, ma'am. Once inside, Jerry made an excuse to leave and returned wearing a mask. He forced her to take off all her clothes and took pictures of her nude body before running out of the room. A few minutes later, when she was getting dressed to leave, he returned with the stupid excuse that a man in a mask had tied him up, and he just managed to escape, and for some reason the girl believed him and agreed to keep the incident quiet. A short time later, Jerry attacked and beat up a girl who refused to strip for him, and when she filed a report with the police, they began an investigation that ended with them finding all of his stolen women's clothes and the pictures he took of his neighbor while pretending to be a masked intruder. In 1956, after being sent to the psych ward at Oregon State Hospital, Jerry started telling his psychiatrist his fantasies about making an underground dungeon where he could keep captive women that he could abuse at his leisure. Apparently in the 50s, psychiatrists didn't find fantasizing of capturing and raping young women a major concern. They diagnosed him as a borderline schizophrenic, but after nine months he was released because they considered this behavior a juvenile phase that would pass with time. That's some goddamn phase. After barely graduating high school in 1957 and having no plans for college, he decided to join the military. I guess because he thought the hospital shrinks didn't think his fantasies were a big deal, then army shrinks wouldn't either, but he was very wrong. After divulging his fantasies, the army psychiatrist immediately recommended him for discharge as an undesirable. Once he had returned home, his fetish addiction and fantasies took off like a rocket, 
and he began stealing women's underwear and shoes any chance he got. He decided to take things a step further and attempted to kidnap a young woman, but he panicked after knocking her unconscious and stole her shoes and ran away instead. In 1961, at the age of 23, Jerry met a 17-year-old girl named Ralphine while working as an electronics technician. She got off on being in a relationship with someone five years older than her, and she was the, actually the one who took Jerry's virginity. I guess you can't lose your virginity if you're beating the shit out of and... Still in their shoes and their underwear. Yeah, yeah. You can't steal a woman's panties and expect her to sleep with you. I can't. <laughs> She quickly became pregnant, and to avoid the stigma of being parents to an unwed mother, they agreed to let her and Jerry get married in the spring of 1962. Ralphine was young and inexperienced in the ways of men and women, so during the early days of their marriage, she gave in to his perverted requests. Jerry forced his young wife to clean the house completely nude with the exception of high-heeled shoes and would follow her around the house taking pictures. You going to do that for me, babe? Can you Clean the house naked and let me follow you around. No, I'm good. <laughs> he had a basement he kept locked and off limits to Ralphine and the kids where he enjoyed spending his time printing the pictures he took of his wife, cleaning naked and wearing the stolen underwear he'd snatched over the years. I wonder what he was doing with these pictures. I mean, he could see his wife naked any time. So why spend his time in the basement printing out the pictures and stuff? I mean, was he like, do you have sick pen pals? Was he like doing like a pre-internet wife swap photo by mail group or something? <laughs> After a while, weird. huh? He was weird for sure. <laughs> After a while, Ralphine began to refuse Jerry's requests and began cleaning the house clothed. She decided that since she was a mother and pregnant again, the time for his perversions was over. Ralphine wouldn't let Jerry be present for the birth of their son, which hurt him deeply resulting in Jerry wearing his stolen underwear and shoes more and more, sometimes underneath his work clothes. And he would do this, it got to the point where he was doing this every day. Not long after the birth of his second child, Jerry was driving down a Portland street when he noticed an extremely attractive young woman. Being the insatiable pervert that he was, he followed her to her apartment and hid outside watching her through the window. Once she fell asleep, he snuck in, but she woke up in the middle of stealing her underwear and shoes. And rather than run like he did when he, when he knocked that girl out he was trying to kidnap, he jumped on the bed, he strangled her into unconsciousness, and raped her. But he did leave her alive. Not saying that that's, you know, makes him a good guy or anything, but it, at least he didn't kill her. Hoping to spark sexual desire in his wife, he started taking pictures of himself in women's clothes and leaving them around the house, but Ralphine ignored them, which only pissed Jerry off more. I would... Lose my mind if you started leaving naked pictures of yourself around the house. Uh, wearing women's clothes. Wearing women's clothes. Underwear and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be. That wouldn't be a turn on. Yeah, that'd be something else, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh, that'd be the fast track to the to the lawyer's office, I guess. <laughs> By January of 1968, Jerry and Ralphine had stopped being intimate. She had her hands full taking care of two young boys, so Jerry was more than ready for some carnage. When on the 26th, while working in his backyard, he was approached by door-to-door -door encyclopedia saleswoman Linda Slauson. Pretending to be interested, Jerry talked Linda into following him to his basement through an outside door, and once inside, he bashed her on the head and strangled her. Once he was sure she was dead, he went upstairs and gave his wife some money to go out and get dinner with the kids while he stayed home in the basement and played out his disgusting fantasies with Linda Slauson's corpse. You would think he'd try to get rid of her before his family got home, but he kept her for the next few days, changing her outfits and taking pictures while repeatedly sexually assaulting her remains. Once he tired of her, he took her body and dumped it in the Willamette River, but not before cutting her off her foot and putting it in the basement. Jerry liked to take the foot out occasionally and put a shoe on it and masturbate, but after keeping it so long, it rotted away to almost nothing. He dumped it in the river to join the rest of Linda Lawson's body. Months later, Jerry moved his family to a decrepit house in Salem, Oregon. The deciding factor for him choosing this house was that it had a separate garage he could use with a lot more privacy than his old basement. Wow. 
Less than a year after his first kill and before his family even settled into their new house in Salem, Jerry spotted 23-year-old Jay and Susan Whitney broken down on the side of I-5 Highway on November 26, 1968. Jerry managed to convince Jan that all he needed to fix her car were some tools from his garage, so she decided to ride along with him, which would be the last ride of her life. Once in Salem, he raped and strangled her in the passenger seat of the family car. For most people, that would be the end of things, but for Jerry, the insanity had just begun. Over the next few days, Jerry kept Jan's body in his garage hanging from a meat hook where he tur took turns dressing the corpse in a stolen underwear and molesting it while taking tons of pictures. You'd think he'd be in a hurry to get rid of it once he had had his fun with it, but he decided to leave her body hanging there while he went on a Thanksgiving trip with his family. Once again, a serial killer would be blessed with blind luck. While away on his Thanksgiving family weekend, a car lost control and crashed into his garage, causing a large crack in the side of the building. Although quite a few cops arrived on scene, no one took the time to look through the huge crack in the wall because if they had, they would have seen Jan's body swinging from the meat hook. Once home, Jerry took a few days before disposing of Jan's body in the Willamette River. In the meantime, he got the idea to cut off one of her breasts to use it as, as a mold for a breast-shaped paperweight, but he couldn't get it to work. By that time, her body was pretty rotten and the smell was noticeable well outside of the garage. That's when he decided it was time to head to the river to get rid of the latest plaything. His two successful murders, combined with getting away with the crash into his garage, gave Jerry a feeling of invincibility, and he couldn't resist taking things to the next level. Linda Slauson happened upon him in his backyard, and he stumbled across Jan Whitney broken down on the highway. But now, Jerry was ready to take matters into his own hands. He decided it was time to go on the hunt for his next victim. This would allow him to control how things went from beginning to end, including his personal choice of victim. See, now he decides, you know, no more happenstance, no more leaving things to chance, you know. So now he's like, I can control the situation, I can put myself in a position where I can be successful, and I can choose the type of woman dressed the way that I like to be my next victim, rather than just picking someone at random. Right. So on March 27, 1969, dressed in women's clothes from his personal stash, Jerry kidnapped 19-year-old Karen Sprinker from a department store parking garage in Salem, Oregon. As it turns out, Jerry had been walking around on the top of the parking garage where two young girls reported seeing a large man in drag the same day Karen Sprinker's car was found abandoned. Once he had her, he took her to his murder garage, where he spent the next few hours forcing her to model clothes from his stash. When he killed his other victims, he usually knocked them out or just outright strangled them, which was horrifying but fairly quick. With Karen Sprinker, he put a noose around her neck and hoisted her just high enough off the floor that her feet couldn't touch. Then he went into his house to have dinner with his family. When he came back a short time later, she was dead. Like with Jan Whitney, he tried to make a breast-shaped paperweight, but this time he removed both breasts and failed once again. This time he disposed of the body in the Long Tom River rather than the Willamette. What is this guy's deal with trying to make breast-shaped paperweights? I mean, surely that exists somewhere else. And you're going to cut off a piece of dead, rotting meat and expect it to hold its shape to create a mold? I mean, that's just, the guy's not too goddamn bright. No. I mean, he figured the first time that he's going to try to kidnap a woman, or not first time he's going to try to kidnap a woman, but when he first goes on the hunt for his next murder victim, what does this large man do? He throws on women's clothes in the 60s when this is not okay, and he's parading around on the top of a parking garage. <laughs> I mean... There's no discretion there. There's no stealth. He basically should have stood on top of the building waving a big flag that said, Can I murder you? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Come on. He made himself easily stand out to anybody who might later be, you know, approached as a witness. The guy's a moron. The simple fact that he hung her just off the floor so she would know how close life was, but ultimately unreachable, it is so sadistic that it's almost unimaginable. Not only that, 
But then he goes inside to eat with his wife and his kids, knowing she's just outside suffering and dying like it's nothing. All I can say is fucking wow. Just unbelievable. All right. Less than a month later, and fueled by his success using a parking garage, on the 21st of April, he attacked Sharon Wood in another local garage. But when he tried to subdue her, she bit the shit out of his thumb so violently that he let her go completely, allowing her to run away screaming while he hauled ass himself. Okay. I guess he decided after the violent struggle of an adult woman, he would try an easier target. So, a few days after letting Sharon Wood escape, he spotted 12-year-old Gloria Smith walking to school. He got out of his car, and he slowly approached Gloria while removing a fake pistol from his jacket and ordering her to walk to his car. But before he get her into the car, this bright young girl saw a woman working in her yard and ran screaming towards her, asking for help, saying she was being kidnapped. All right, Jerry absolutely freaked out, and the witness said that he was trying to run while stumbling to his car out of panic, and he actually hit himself in the face with the door because he was <laughs> trying to open it too quickly. What a dumbass. The, yeah, the guy's tripping over himself trying to get away and then almost knocks himself out with his own car door. How is this guy having any success? How is he not even already on prison? I mean, come on, the guy, jeez. This just goes to show you that for some reason, serial killer or not, they're given their own amount of luck in their lives. Yeah. You know, I mean, because this is just pure dumb luck. Maybe it's because they're so dumb they have so much dumb luck. Maybe. (laughs) Once inside, he sped off, almost hitting multiple cars and a telephone pole in his desperation to escape. But unfortunately... She was unable to get his license plate number. More dumb luck. By this time, Jerry was starting to get really pissed off. Not only had he failed twice in a row to secure another victim, but a 12-year-old girl got away from him. He decided it was time to be smarter about things and put a little more planning in place before going on the hunt again. He really outdid himself this time. Jerry went out and bought himself a fake police badge and began cruising the parking lot of a Portland shopping center where he spotted Linda Saley. I don't know how he did it without a uniform or a police car and a plastic badge, but he managed to convince her that he suspected her of shoplifting and that she had to go with him. He told her to get in his car, then drove her back to his garage of death where he tied her up. Then he went into the house for dinner. It's crazy that no matter what this guy is doing, he takes the time to stop and go eat during regular meal times. All right, this is the third victim that he stopped to go eat with. <laughs> right? Maybe his wife was adamant about everyone being at the table on time, or maybe he's just really liked his wife's cooking, but it's nuts that not even murder could keep him away from his wife's meatloaf. Right? So now we get to the mysterious and unbelievable part of the tragedy. When Jerry got back to the garage after dinner, he saw that Linda Selly had removed her restraints and she was free, but for some reason, she just sat there and didn't try to run. All right, I've thought about this and for a while and I couldn't figure it out. Most people would say, well, she was in a state of shock and she was unable to get her shit together enough to run, right? You're in a state of shock, you, you just kind of freeze up. Right. I don't think so. Because she had the presence of mind enough to work her way out of her ropes and her bonding. So running shouldn't have been an issue. Okay. But regardless of why she didn't run, he tied her back up and he took a bunch of pictures of her before ultimately deciding to hang her, finally killing her. Okay. Linda Saley was his fourth victim, but police didn't even know about the first one, let alone the rest of the women. The only reason the cops became aware that anything was happening is because a fisherman saw Linda Saley's body floating down the Long Tom River on May 10th, 1969. A couple of days later, police divers found the body of Karen Sprinker just a few feet from Linda's body, and they knew they had a killer on their hands. This is when police decided to canvass the campus of Oregon State University where Karen Sprinker was a student. And while asking questions, one student mentioned a weird older man roaming the campus hitting on young women. 
One female student remembers having gone on a date with the guy, and she expected to hear from him again. This was the break police were waiting for, and when Jerry Brutos called her seeking that second date, police got his personal information from her. When Jerry's victims were found, they were still tied with an unusual knot that was common to the electrician's trade when pulling wires through a house. While doing a background check on Jerry Brutos, they discovered that he was an electronic technician, and they also found the records of his earlier attacks on young women he was a teenager. This gave them more than enough incentive to pay him a visit, and while searching his garage, they found a section of rope matching the kind used to restrain the two bodies found in the Long Tom River. By this time, Brutos is so arrogant that he offers the cops a sample of the rope, which they glad gladly took and later verified as an exact match. Jerry could tell that he had pushed his luck too far and decided it was time to go before police came to get him. Near the end of May of 1969, Brutos packed his wife and kids into the family killmobile and headed for Canada, but they were spotted by Oregon State Police before making it to the border. He was arrested for the attempted assault of 14-year-old Gloria Smith, who got away by running to a woman working in her yard, but once police had him in custody, he couldn't wait to brag in great detail about the murders he had committed. He remorselessly described the women he'd killed as objects and compared them to candy wrappers that needed to be thrown away when he was done with them. This just goes to show how heartless this guy was, and how he didn't even see his victims as human beings. As far as he was concerned, they were temporarily useful garbage that didn't matter in the slightest. June 27, 1969, Jerry Brudos pled guilty to all charges and received three life sentences. Once again, folks, I don't get it. He's charged with and convicted of murdering these women and gets a sentence that allows him to be eligible for parole after 36 years in 2005. He never made parole, but after the things he did, it shouldn't be an option. He earned two college degrees in general sciences and counseling while in prison and was working on a master's in counseling as well. In 1995, the Oregon Parole Board made the decision to ban him from future parole consideration. This royally pissed him off. Although he was given courtesy meetings every two years, he claimed they were violating his rights by removing him from consideration since he wasn't sentenced to life without parole. All right, I can see his point here. I'm not trying to justify anything he did or take his side in any way, but, you know, yes, he was a torturing rapist, murderer, and necrophiliac, but no convicted person should be deprived of their legal rights. Okay, <clears throat> it's part of what makes our flawed system of justice blind. And once we start using deprivation of rights as a form of legal revenge, you know, we throw the integrity of our, of our legal system right out the window. Although we fought the removal of parole consideration, the decision was upheld by the federal courts. After feeling sick for a few months off and on and noticing blood in his stool, Brutos went to the prison infirmary who, after sending his blood out for testing, referred him to the local hospital for more tests. His test resulted in a diagnosis for colon cancer, and he underwent surgery to remove it in 2004, but by that time it had already spread without his doctors realizing it. In 2005, he was diagnosed with liver cancer, and even with chemotherapy, you know, he died from the disease on March 28, 2009, in the Oregon State Penitentiary at the age of 67. He was the longest-serving prisoner in Oregon State history at just two months shy of serving 37 years. Years. All right, we've come to the end of another episode, this time going into the mind and actions of a man who not only liked to rape and kill women, but who enjoyed playing house and raping their corpses as well. There's some sick ass people in the world, folks, and this guy was at the top of the list. Make sure to stop by next week for another earful of murder and mayhem when we'll be investigating Joseph James D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer. This guy raped over 50 women. He killed at least 13 women and committed over 120 burglaries. I mean, when did this guy have time to do anything else? Don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to follow us on our podcast journey into the world of America's serial killers. And visit us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or email us directly at elton at taskg.net or cherish at taskg.net if you have any recommendations, cases you'd like us to cover, or just want to say hey. Thanks again, loyal taskers, and we'll see you next kill.